Good morning or good afternoon to all. The next speaker is Professor Daniel Petersem for his second lecture on numerical homogenization. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio. And uh, yeah, hello to the world. Uh, thank you for being uh, here for my second lecture. Um, let me start uh, offering you the opportunity to raise maybe questions that are relevant before I start uh, right now. You could actually do this while I'm preparing uh, the screen share. If there are no urgent questions, then let me remind you that uh, the material is available uh, in the repository. I shared the link yesterday and I will share it again after the lecture. Uh, the plan for today is uh, to look a bit deeper into the mathematical arguments of the methodology that I started to present yesterday. And uh, let me start by recalling the model problem we are dealing with, which is the simple diffusion problem in variational form minus divergence A gradient U equals some right-hand side F. Yeah? And the kind of notation we need is the uh, we have a homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition here. So our uh, solution space is nothing but H10, and I will denote it V most of the time. And the uh, bilinear form or the inner product that is associated with our problem is called A. The coefficient that we are dealing with is uh, a general L infinity coefficient that uh, is bounded from below and above. Uh, in a uniform way. Uh, I haven't so far really quantified uh, the lower and the upper bounds. So what we will need later on is that the L infinity norm of A is bounded by beta and that A is uh, coercive, meaning that it's bounded from below by the parameter alpha. Yeah, so alpha and beta would be my upper and lower uniform bounds for the coefficient matrix A. Okay, other than that, there are no assumptions on A. For, as I said, for the sake of simplicity, I consider A to be symmetric. Yeah, and the kind of coefficients we are dealing with are, for example, shown here. Now I explained you, or try to explain you what we are trying to do. And the first step in the construction was uh, uh, a scale decomposition. Recall that, uh, Capital H in our in this lecture series is a parameter that we can choose. Uh, you should think of something that is rather coarse, at least coarse compared to the typical oscillation length and the coefficients. And uh, we will consider a mesh-based approach. So tau H will be a regular finite element mesh. Think of triangles in 2D, for example. And VH will be a subspace of H10 that consists of continuous functions that vanish at the boundary and are otherwise piecewise affine on each of the finite elements. And then we have seen uh, the, the other ingredient was our interpolation operator or quasi interpolation operator. That's just something that uh, maps H10 functions into finite element function as depicted here. And it does it in such a way that uh, information uh, or spread of information is local, meaning that to get the uh, approximation uh, or the interpolation at the point, you only need information about the underlying function in a certain neighborhood of size capital H. So typically in the neighboring elements. Other than that, I want the interpolation operator to be projective and to satisfy standards, uh, stability and approximation uh, error bounds in a local fashion. Yeah, and I also explained to you or showed you a typical choice of IH based on the uh, first step uh, interpolating in each of the finite elements independently or projecting in L2 to linear functions and then uh, constructing out of this discontinuous piecewise linear function a continuous piecewise linear function simply by nodal averaging. Okay, and now uh, the most important step for deriving the methodology was the scale decomposition. 
and maybe it has not completely, uh, it's not com entirely clear to everybody why I call this a decomposition of scales. Uh, this was the initial version. Now the later version was this one here. So we take the space, our energy space, and we uh, construct two subspaces. One subspace is called W. I call it the space of fine scale functions and W is uh, nothing but the kernel of the interpolation operator IH. So these are functions by which the interpolation vanishes. These are functions that oscillates on scales capital H and smaller. And then we have the other part, which is nothing but the A orthogonal complement of W. And uh, we have derived it uh, in a step uh, using this correction operator C. And this will be uh, the major object of research for today. C is the operator that maps H10 functions or finite element functions onto uh, the kernel space W. And it simply does it in an A orthogonal way. So I take VH in VH and I compute the best approximation in the space of fine scale functions. So this is the A orthogonal projection onto the subspace W. And using this C, one can characterize the orthogonal complement of W by uh, taking the complementary projection and apply it to the finite element functions. Uh, excuse so, me, Professor Petersi. Yeah. Your um, uh, uh, slides are just half of the whole thing. Okay, uh, then I thank you for the comment. Let me try to fix the problem by simply sharing once again. Does it look better now? Yes, it's good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay, uh, fortunately, this was only the revision from yesterday, so I can probably simply continue. I was trying to uh, once again explain the decomposition of H10 functions into functions that have vanishing interpolation in finite elements, and it's A orthogonal complement. Uh, which we write in this way here by applying a projection operator, namely one minus C uh, to the space of finite element functions. Yeah, and th this part here is nothing but the A orthogonal complement of the W space. So this is a decomposition of the full space into two subspaces, a finite dimensional one given here and an infinite dimensional one containing all the fine scales. And this kind of separates scales uh, in the following sense, namely the objects that are in the space W. Yeah, uh, if I take a W function and compute its L2 norm, then what I can immediately do is because W functions have vanishing interpolation, I can subtract its interpolation and uh, now I can use the fact that IH has nice interpolation or approximation properties in L2. So if I measure the interpolation error in L2, I, this will be bounded by some constant that is uh, independent of the problem parameters. It just depends on angles in the mesh. So I will hide it in the tilde. Uh, but other than that, I will get a power of H times the gradient of V. Yeah, and now using the, uh, uh, the uniform upper and lower bounds, I could also rewrite this uh, using the energy norm A square root W in L2, okay? So what you are seeing here is that the L2 norm of a function in W is much smaller or uh, compared to the energy norm uh, is smaller by a factor of H. Yeah? So if we would go with our capital H to zero, uh, you can see that the, uh, these kind of objects here vanish uh, in the sense of L2. Yeah, this is a similar kind of uh, argument as you have seen in the previous lecture uh, for going to the homogenization limit. But in our case, we are not so much interested in limits. Yeah, we will keep the H typically fixed. 
But uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that in terms of energy, so if you consider Rayleigh quotients, for example, the W functions have the property that their energy is bounded from below by uh, H to the minus two. Yeah? So in there, there are only functions that have, have energy H to the minus two and larger. Whereas in the other part, uh, in the VHMS part, if you consider such an object, one minus C uh, gradient of some VH, say in the energy norm, then you know, of course, that C is the A orthogonal projection. So its norm is one. So you can essentially remove the C here uh, without making uh, the object much bigger. And then you can also drop the A one half power and estimate it by the uniform upper bound beta, which I hide also in the tilde. And then you end up having the, simply the gradient of a finite element function. And now for finite element function, they cannot oscillate arbitrarily. Uh, they satisfy what is called in finite element theory an inverse estimate. So you can bound its H1 norm by a negative power of H times their L2 norm. Okay. And uh, now this tells you that if you try to look at the Rayleigh quotient or the energy of a function that is in this coarse part of the decomposition, then the energy is uniformly bounded by H to the minus two, yeah? by simply dividing by the L2 norm. So in other sense, uh, in other words, what I have achieved is I've separated the, the full space into function that have energy larger than H to the minus two in the fine scale part and smaller than H to the minus two in the coarse scale part. When I say energy here, I always mean energy relative to unit mass. Yeah, and in this sense, this is a decomposition of energies or... Okay, so this is kind of uh, underlying the method. And then the next step was to simply consider the following method. Namely, we are looking for a Galerkin approximation now in the coarse part uh, of our decomposition. And now I can either write, uh, I'm looking for the function u, HMS in the space VHMS such that a UHMS tested with any function in the same space equals the right hand side. Yeah, that would be the standard Galerkin formulation using the space, or I use that the fact that I know how functions. Uh, I have a, another characterization of these objects given by using this complementary projection. And this is what I did here. So I characterize any object in this space by, a by the underlying finite element function. And I keep applying one minus C to all the finite element functions. Both of these versions are possible. Uh, there's actually a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between the two spaces VHMS and VH. Namely, you go from here to here with one minus C, and obviously you go in the other direction by IH. Yeah? So these spaces are isomorphic to each other. And uh, one minus C is an invertible map as a mapping from VH to VHMS, and the inverse is IH. Okay, now we want to understand uh, better this kind of method. And the next step we did yesterday was to uh, show that actually this is super accurate. And the argument yesterday was to show that the solution you produce by this method is exactly IH of U. Okay, so the finite element uh, represent, uh, representative of the solution is the quasi interpolation of the true solution. And of course, once you have the quasi interpolation at your, ha at your hand, you can have uh, very nice uh, error estimates independent of uh, any regularity of the problem or the actual coefficient that is behind. Because whenever you now measure the error in L2, uh, it will just be an interpolation error. And since uh, the solution of the problem is in H1, 
we will always get one power of h out of this construction. Okay, now for today, we want to discuss whether or not this can be turned into an actual computational method. And the most important step for this is to understand the role of the operator C here. And uh, this is what comes on the next slides. Yeah, and uh, so C, this orthogonal projection onto the space of fine scale functions is unfortunately uh, a global operator. Yeah, this is, I mean, we have just, it's very close to the actual PDE operator. We just have removed a finite number of functions from the energy space. So it's a, it's a global mapping, but it has the very nice property that it decays very fast. And let me try to say again what I mean by this. So if you take a finite element function that is supported, say, uh, it has local support. For example, you could take a finite element basis function, a head function, for example, associated uh, as depicted here. Yeah, so say that there is a node Z at the center of my domain and lambda is the corresponding finite element head function, then you can see that the action of C of lambda hat, uh, C of lambda Z, uh, that this gives an object that has, it seems that the support is not much larger than the support of the underlying head function. And you can, in, the color coding indicates that something is happening also far away from the center but uh, it seems to be very small. And this is quantified now in the right picture where you see uh, in logarithmic color coding, the absolute value of uh, C or one minus C applied to lambda Z. And what you can see is that, you know, all the blue areas, they, uh, they re refer to values that are 10 to the minus four or smaller. And you can see it goes from yellow, which would be order one, to uh, dark blue, which would be order 10 to the minus eight very fast. So this indicates exponential convergence and the convergence is, is in kind of, can be quantified in terms of layers of finite elements that fit in between two points. And this is what the theorem tries to tell you. So if I measure the H1 semi-norm or the energy norm of my corrected function, and I don't measure it in the full domain, but I cut out uh, a certain subdomain. And in my case, I would cut out uh, uh, a patch of finite elements surrounding the central vertex Z. Uh, in this case, in my picture here with L layers of finite elements. So if I cut out this and I measure the energy out here, then it turns out that this energy be, uh, scales like uh, the energy of the finite element function that I started with times a factor that behaves like e to the minus l, where l is this uh, number of layers of finite elements in the patch. This tells you that if I cut out a larger piece, I will get a kind of a much smaller energy. And only, and all the energy is concentrated around the, the, the center here, the support of the function vh. And uh, as I promised, I want to, uh, this is kind of the most important, I would say, uh, argument in turning this uh, idea into a method. That's why I want to go a bit deeper into the proof. And I prepared some empty pages here to go with you through the main steps of the, of the proof. Uh, if you, you can also find the proof in my lecture notes uh, perfectly uh, uh, formulated uh, there. It is contained in chapter four. Okay, so the proof uh, uses standard techniques of analysis, I would say. So we will employ a cutoff function to do some sort of Kachopoly type argument. So uh, proof. So in my proof, eta is a cutoff function. And my cutoff function will be just a finite element function. Uh, that's sufficiently smooth for my purposes. And 
eta has the following properties, uh, namely eta is equal to zero in say a neighborhood of the central or some central element or the central node Z uh, that has size L to the minus three. So all this counting of layers is kind of, uh, has been done previously and fits now perfectly to the argument. Uh, so the numbers will become clear a posteriori. Okay, so this here refers uh, to the following situation. You have your mesh. Uh, I prefer to draw quadrilaterals because it's easier. And somewhere in my mesh, I have the node Z and then N one of Z would be simply the union of finite elements uh, containing the vertex Z and N two would be uh, all the elements neighboring the patch N1 and so on. Yeah? So NL obviously is uh, is a patch of finite elements or a union of finite elements uh, whose diameter is roughly L times the mesh size. Yeah? Okay, so uh, eta will be one uh, in outside uh, another patch, namely in, I take the whole domain and I cut out uh, the smaller patch NL minus two. Sorry, I need to make a correction here. Okay, once again, uh, the proof, uh, sorry, here we go. Proof, second part. Uh, so we construct a cutoff function. Now let me try it, uh, only the 1D situation. I think you have already understood. There is some central node here. This is my mesh. I, I consider some sort of neighborhood of uh, the node Z that I will call N, L minus two, so I will count the layers. And then then we'll consider the next bigger layer N L minus, so this will be three, this will be two. And then the function I consider will be one uh, outside here. Then it will go to zero in this one layer of finite elements, and then it will be zero in the neighborhood of the vertex there. That should be at the center and not uh, shifted. So maybe it's better to put the Z here. Yeah? And this function I call eta. Yeah, and what I want to look at is the following. So uh, in my theorem, I'm using this general function VH. Now I make a choice, namely I took the final, I take the finite element function Z, lambda Z. So this would be the function that is supported here, the head function associated with the node Z. Okay, and uh, I'm trying to compute uh, for you C of VH or C of lambda Z. And what is it? Uh, I will call it phi in the following and phi satisfies a variational problem. Phi solves, this variation the problem here for all W in W. Okay, and phi itself is also a function in W. And W is the kernel of IH. So this is a closed subspace of H10. Okay, and the proof tries to do the following. So I will just prove it for this particular choice. So this is a function which has support in the center. And uh, now I want to show you how the energy of phi, uh, how big the energy of phi is outside a certain neighborhood of the node Z. So what I want to compute is the following quantity. I want to compute A, the energy norm of phi in a neighborhood, say uh, L2 of the do whole domain when I subtract L layers of finite elements. So this is an even bigger domain that doesn't really fit to my picture here. So I consider 
an even bigger, bigger uh, neighborhood NL. Now I'm looking at the energy of phi outside NL. And uh, the first step is I simply plug in now my eta here, which I can because outside this patch, uh, eta is equal to one. So there is actually equality here at this stage. But uh, of course, in the next step, I will simply use the fact that eta is uh, uh, non-negative and uh, I don't even need it. So I will just make the quantity bigger by now going, by just making, uh, by removing the NL here. So I mean, I can go to the full domain and now eta will help me, uh, or eta is designed in such a way that the quantity gets bigger. Okay, so I will essentially add a zero in the center here, and then I will add some parts that are related to the areas where eta is between zero and one. Yeah, I should maybe add that eta, uh, as depicted here, has a few more properties. So eta uh, maps uh, d into zero one. And uh, by construction with this kind of finite element type of function, I have that the L infinity norm of eta is uniformly bounded by a negative power of H. Yeah, that's something I will need later on. Okay, now uh, let's rewrite this term in an integral form, uh, which is simply the integral A gradient phi gradient phi the x uh, and I forgot the eta, I put the eta here. Okay, and now I'm just uh, doing uh, standard arguments uh, like in a Kaczapoli type of uh, argument. I use the product rule yeah, to uh, let eta and phi kind of interchange their rules. So I can rewrite this as the gradient of eta times phi minus uh, phi times the gradient of eta. Yeah, and uh, this provides me with the following terms, a gradient phi multiplied with the gradient of eta phi. And I leave some space here because I will plug in something. Uh, and then I have the other term, which is, it gets a minus. So integral over d a gradient phi uh, phi gradient eta dx, okay? And uh, this is uh, almost where I, I want to end up. And the idea of the proof is the following. Uh, I know that phi satisfies a variational problem, the one that is given here. Okay, so if I test phi with a function that is in W, then I can transfer or can translate the action of phi to, uh, or I can replace phi by lambda z. And now lambda z is a function that has local support just very close to the node z. So if I test here with a function that is in W but has support outside the neighboring elements of z, then the result will be zero. Yeah, and so the idea is, or the whole construction is designed in such a way that this term here disappears. And uh, the argument is, is almost done, but uh, it's not quite correct because uh, we have some difficulty here, which is that phi is a function in the kernel of IH, uh, multiplication with uh, smooth, sufficiently smooth cutoff function eta, uh, is okay in the sense that the product remains in V, but uh, the interpolation doesn't vanish anymore. So unfortunately, phi in W does not imply eta phi in W, okay? So we violate the interpolation constraint in our W space. And that's why we need to do one more step here in the proof, which is, we make it a W function by subtracting its interpolation here. 
Yeah, because one minus i h applied to whatever function in v is always a function that is in w. And then I simply have to compensate for the for subtracting i h of eta phi by adding it again. And now I'm slightly running out of space here. I will squeeze it here. So I have to add a gradient phi uh, times gradient i h of eta phi dx, okay? With the previous argument, uh, this term here drops because eta phi is a function that lives somewhere out here, okay? And uh, I simply apply ih to it. And ih is, uh, was assumed to be local in the sense that it spreads the support at most by one layer of elements. And I left enough space in between here at least if L is large enough. So maybe we should assume something like L is larger than, I think I will later on need four to make the proof very rigorous. But if there's enough space here, then this function here will have support uh, outside the direct neighborhood of that. So this term drops. And what we have achieved is we have bounded the energy of phi outside the patch NL by the, by two terms. Let me go to the next page. Uh, I will just write what we have achieved. So a gradient phi in L2 d minus nL, I will skip the z, is bounded by two terms and I will just do absolute values. The first term looks like uh, phi a gradient of phi gradient eta. And the second term looks like uh, a gradient phi uh, gradient i h of eta phi dx. And now we simply uh, uh, have to estimate these two terms further and I, there will not much interesting will happen. The typical arguments of numerical analysis will apply, uh, namely uh, Cauchy-Schwarz type, Hölder type of inequalities and interpolation error estimates. So for estimating the first term, let's call it maybe number one. Term number one and term number two. So term number one is bounded by yeah, uh, as you see, I will uh, squeeze out the gradient of eta in the L infinity norm. Because I already know that this is bounded by in terms of H or negative powers of H. And then for the rest, I will do a Cauchy-Schwarz type of thing before, of course, I will also squeeze out uh, the one half power of beta, which is the upper bound. Uh, these I will typically hide in the tilde notation. So the remaining terms here will be a phi in L2 and a gradient of phi or energy of phi in L2. Yeah? And now the, what is important here is on which kind of domains I evaluate these norms. And uh, what helps me here is the following. So gradient of eta yeah, is a function. So eta is a function that is constant almost uh, in most parts of the domain. And the only part where eta is non-constant is in the subdomain uh, eta L minus two minus N L minus three. Yeah, so recall that eta was a function that looked like that. Yeah, and this here was the boundary of n l minus three, and this here was the boundary of the domain n l minus two. Yeah, and the only kind of places where eta has a non-vanishing gradient is in these two subdomains. Okay, so I will plug the same thing here: eta n l minus two minus n l minus three. Okay, so uh, let's further estimate. So uh, as I said, this here gradient is one over H. This gives a negative power of H. Uh, the L2 norm of phi 
phi is a function that is in W. W functions have vanishing interpolation, meaning that I can subtract uh, always the interpolation. So I can write here phi minus I H of phi, because this is simply zero yeah. in L2, and L minus two and L minus three. And uh, this term is already fine. I just keep it as it is. And with the same kind of uh, ring type of domain. And here I use now the interpolation error estimate. So this can be bounded by the power of H times uh, the gradient of phi. And I can also, because of the uniformity of the upper and lower bounds, I can directly squeeze in the A to the one half here. So all these proofs wouldn't work in a high contrast case where the upper and lower bounds have a quite different uh, order of uh, uh, size. Um, but other than that, I can use this estimate. And because the interpolation operator is not purely local, I will. I will kind of, uh, the domain here on which I have to evaluate the gradient spreads out a little bit by one layer of elements. So it would be NL minus one, NL minus four then, okay. And uh, now this term here, I can simply uh, control also by this term. So I can just make it bigger by considering a larger domain. Uh, so altogether, I get the following result. Uh, the h power here and the negative h power, they cancel so that I end up having something of the format. Uh, the first term is bounded by a to the one half gradient of phi in some domain n l minus one n l minus four squared. Now let's look at the whole uh, estimate again. So here we have started the energy of phi outside the domain NL is bounded by the energy of phi in a, in a ring kind of that is uh, kind of neighboring this, this domain here. Now, there is a second term here missing. So uh, I also have to estimate the second term and as you will see in the lecture notes, the type of arguments are really the same as I used to estimate the first term. So by the very same arguments, uh, you can also estimate one plus two in one stroke if you want. Uh, and the simple, the only thing that you get is because IH appears already here, you have to do interpolation error estimates twice so that you spread out your domain twice and you end up having, instead of this domain an L minus one and L minus four, you will end up having an L minus and L minus five or so. Now it depends on how accurately or how, how accurately you work in your estimates, uh, but roughly this will be the picture. So that altogether, you, one is able to prove an estimate of the following form, energy of phi outside the patch NL is bounded by some constant and the constant depends on angles of my mesh and I, I, it depends on alpha and beta. But it does not depend on any kind of oscillations of the coefficient. It does not depend on, on an epsilon parameter if there is any. And it does not depend on capital H times uh, the energy A of phi in the domain L2 NL minus, uh, sorry, minus NL minus five. Okay. Now I write it without this, uh, I write it with the squares maybe. Okay, and now it's clear how the argument continues. We have estimated the energy of phi in my whole domain, that is here. So the energy outside, we have now estimated by the energy in this ring here. And now one simply writes uh, the energy in the ring as the difference, 
So this here can be written as the difference of the energies. Uh, everything outside the, the patch NL. Yet. So I can write this, everything outside the smaller domain, which would be uh, L2 D minus N L minus five minus uh, the energy outside the larger patch, which would relate to the, uh, the complement of NL. Yeah. And now you see what we uh, have achieved is uh, an estimate of the following form. We have estimated the energy outside NL uh, by the sum of two terms. One is the energy in a outside, like a slightly smaller patch. Uh, and uh, then something with a sign that is now important minus the same energy scaled by the initial constant. So from this, you can write, you can put this term here on the left-hand side, where it simply produces a one plus C alpha beta times A to the one half gradient of phi squared. I will just write the domains now, NL. And this is bounded by C alpha beta A one half gradient of phi outside NL minus five. Okay, now I simply divide by one plus C alpha beta. And what we have achieved is a contraction. So the energy outside NL is bounded by the energy outside NL minus five, which is a larger domain, but the factor here is uh, strictly smaller than one. Okay. And it depends on, on the size of the constant C, how close it gets to one. So for very high contrast, it will be close to one, but for a uniform or well-behaved alpha and beta, it will be, it will stay away from one. And now the rest of the proof is clear. You simply bootstrap this argument. Okay. Now you show that the energy or the energy here can be bounded by again the same factor times the energy in D minus NL minus 10 and so on. So that after a few steps, if we name this constant here gamma, you will be able to show something like uh, uh, gamma to some power times. Uh, the energy in the initial domain uh, is very close to the node Z or the full energy of the function phi at the very end on the whole domain. And the question is how many times can you play this argument? And this will be something of the order of L divided by five, maybe around it in some sense. And this now corresponds to the exponential decay. Yeah. The rest of the proof is simply to rewrite everything uh, in this exponential form as I phrased the theory. Yeah. And you see in my theorem also, I made explicit the dependence on alpha and beta. Yeah, and this is kind of the main argument uh, and I'm almost done uh, for the proof. Uh, and it nicely quantifies the decay that you also observe here in practice. And the obvious idea that we will discuss tomorrow to turn this into a method is now the computation of C uh, applied to a localized function can be restricted to a small subdomain around the vertex Z. And in this sense, uh, I will be computing only cor uh, correctors only locally and this will be the basis for the numerical homogenization methods. And uh, I think uh, I reached the end of my lecture and I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Okay. Thank you very much for your lecture. Any question, any remark? If someone has a remark or a question, again, okay, write in chat.
it seems no remark, no question. If you want, if you want to continue, Daniel, or you will stop here, as you prefer. Uh, I don't mind. Let me just uh, say a few general remarks, maybe uh, to close uh, the session. Uh, as I said, all the material is uh, also, that's why my, my handwriting is very poor, but I prepared lecture notes for you. You can uh, read the proof there in all details, uh, very in a very rigorous fashion in the lecture notes. And uh, I can give an outlook to tomorrow's lecture where we will simply do what I just said. Instead of computing the action of C in the global domain, we can restrict ourselves to small patches. And uh, this means in practice that we will get a two scale method if you want. Uh, we will be, we are interested in a method that acts on the global scale that looks like a finite element method on the, on the, on the macroscopic scale capital H. But in order to assemble the matrices, we will have to uh, compute the action of C locally on the basis functions, which gives uh, corrector problems uh, in the spirit of corrector problems in homogenization, if you want. Yeah, they are slightly different. So Excuse me. Not... Yeah. That... Who is... yeah? There, is, there is a question. Oh, yeah. You can read the... Uh, is there a possible translation to find a volume method? Uh, most likely, yes. Uh, I haven't considered in my own uh, work uh, uh, finite volume formulations, but we have considered uh, petrov galerkin versions of the method that are very much in the spirit of finite volumes. So, uh, yes, I believe there is, but I don't think there is a a reference that would uh, work this out. Okay, thank. If you want to continue, would you? Thanks. Yeah, okay. so we'll just uh, do this two scale version. So we will have to solve these local problems on patches of finite elements uh, in the space W. Uh, I will say a few words tomorrow and I will share some code with you so you can start uh, playing around uh, with the method. And uh, yeah, I think uh, that's about it. The rest uh, will be done tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much and see you tomorrow for the last lecture. Thank you. I think we resume in at, in 20 minutes now, I think. Is okay, Nanda? 20, 22 minutes, yes. 20 minutes, we'll start. So we, everyone has a break. They can have their cup of coffee and come back for the lecture.